Hallelujah. God is good. So, you can't help but wonder sometimes the sovereignty of God and his love toward us and how amazing and big it is when you know who you were in sin and the kinds of things that you've done. And if you're like me to see where you are today, you can't help but wonder, um, you know, who, who am I that God would be so mindful of me? That's the word of God. That's the scripture. Uh, who am I, Lord, that you'd be so mindful of me? You can't help but humble yourself and acknowledge that God is your saving hand. He's your saving grace because of just what he pulled you out of. The word of God says that he will pull you out of darkness and translate us into his marvelous light. And when you can testify of the goodness of God in that regard, you can't but help. You can't help but wonder in amazement of what what God is this that can forgive such sins and love so greatly. And so as I consider this and I want you all to consider this, the goal is to be so amazed and given to God that you worship him in spirit and in truth. Not necessarily for us to reminisce on things that can cause us to be heartbroken again or to be ashamed of the things that we used to do or how we used to dress or how we even used to talk. My goodness, the ways we used to talk and the kinds of things we used to do just to kind of fit into the culture, whatever culture you're from. Every culture has its way. And outside of God, we're given to the world, the, the rudiments of this life, the, the traditions of man. And a lot of the times, the things that we drive and strive after are things that makes God's word of non-effect. It just a null and a void. And a, a, so it seems it makes God's word cancel out because we become what we want to be. And so sometimes we could just wake up and find ourselves in some messed up situations. So we don't have to go deep into those types of things. But what I want to talk about is just how awesome God is in that you can just ask him to forgive you. And he forgives you of your um, an, an unrighteousness and cleanses you of your iniquity. He just, just says, just to confess it, confess it to him. You know, go to someone who is considered an elder in the faith and speak to those people and allow them to pray over you so that you may be healed and that you may be set free. God extends that mercy to us and it's available for everybody, everybody, as long as you are breathing, as long as you are in a position where you can make a decision to say, I'm going to follow Jesus. This applies to you. And so I was thinking about how a response of someone like that should look like. Think about the sovereignties of God and how before he judges a people, he ha he, he's not rash or impulsive. He is not uh, double-minded or unsteady or unstable. A lot of us, when we're frustrated or, or afraid or proud, a lot of the decisions that we make comes from that place in our hearts. Because it's really just our way of trying to protect something that we think will be lost. And so when we operate under the fear or pride, what we're not realizing is happening is that we lose more than we think we're protecting or gaining. And so I love that God isn't that way. He isn't like man in that he is threatened by us. He's not afraid that we can blaspheme him in his holy name. He's not afraid that we might not believe him at his word. He's not afraid that if he gives to us, that we're just going to curse him in his face and then and walk away and go die. He's not afraid that we're not going to love him as much as he loves us. None of that is a factor in the way that God governs. None of that is a factor on what God is presenting to you as a human being that is in need of, of deliverance, in need of salvation. He looks down and he's mindful of you. Who am I that you are so mindful of me? You're nothing. But yet you are made in the image and in the likeness of God. You bear the breath of life that comes from God. Every living creature that has breath is, is, is called to praise God. And when you can step outside of the pride, step outside of the fears, 
step outside of the unbelief or the insecurities and know, man, God is good and his mercy endures forever. It, it, it's a response. So let me talk about the, the righteousness and the justice of God. There are many passages in the Bible that we can talk about. And y'all got to hold my hand so we can, so I can get y'all to the end of what I'm talking about. So this is a whole thought process, y'all. If y'all follow me, y'all, then y'all know how this works with my thought processes. So in any passages from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it talks about the severity of God and it talks about the righteous judgment of God. It talks about his, his love towards his creation and his long suffering and his patience towards man. It talks about how, um, you can read certain passages, for, for an example, in Joshua chapter 2, there's this situation where three tribes were on one side of Jordan because they had much cattle and they saw that the land was good. This was all in their pursuit of conquest as they were um, just transitioning out of Moses' rulership to Joshua. They were acquiring that land flowing with milk and honey. This is now where we get to read about the blessings and the promises of God from Abraham coming into fruition in these people's lives. But they got to fight and they got to endure and persevere. And so three of the tribes actually wanted to stay on one side of Jordan. His ha, history Bible study lesson, right? And then the remaining tribes had to, um, were willing to cross over Jordan and pass over and to conquer the rest of the land that God had given them in the land of Canaan. And so as that was happening and, and they were uh, gaining uh, much of their inheritance, there was a need for them to maintain the order of serving God as far as performing sacrificing and serving God and, and keeping themselves sanctified and acknowledging that God is good. And so that would require the tribes that were on one on one side of the Jordan to have to travel great distances to the other tribe sometimes to burn offerings, burn offerings and peace offerings and other things alike to serve God as as often as they are required to. And so as you read the passage, if I, if if I I would have to refresh my memory on the specifics, but a lot of the reason was so what they decided to do on the other half of Jordan was they were to build an altar. They built an altar and they didn't they didn't yet confer they didn't necessarily confer with the rest of the tribes. They kind of just did what they thought was right and pleasing to the Lord. So they built an altar, not just so that they can have a place to burn offerings and commit sacrifices, but also so that their children can know that you know, that, that this is a witness that God is with them. At some point, the rest of the tribes heard of this altar, and they assumed that the other tribes have corrupted themselves and were guilty of idolatry. They set it in their minds to go against these three tribes and war against them, because the, the law does say that if if any false prophet, prophet or anybody comes to us and tells us to go up to the mountains or begin to do different things that is idolatry, that we ought to immediately stone and destroy those people. So their, their, their immediate response to the allegations against the three tribes were, let's war against them. But I love the example that we, we, we can read in, in Joshua. That although they had it in their minds to do this as a fulfillment of God's precepts for them, they first made inquisition, the word of God says. They went and investigated. So they sent heads of each tribe and fathers and uh, respected leaders to go and to inquire of this idolatry that they think they're committing just to find out that what they thought it was isn't what it was and that the tribes began to say, you know what, God is going to have to judge if what we did was wrong or not. But these are the reasons behind why we did it. It wasn't just to offer sacrifices, but to also have a witness or to be a witness among our children and many generations to come that God is good and he is among his people. I think about how Sodom and Gomorrah, so that was a good situation. That was good in that the people weren't actually guilty. But what about when you are guilty and you are worthy of damnation and destruction? Sodom and Gomorrah. They committed very much abominations and heinous crimes before God. 
And to be honest, our present condition spiritually right now, globally, is worse than the condition of Sodom and Gomorrah. But what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah, if you don't know, is that it was destroyed in two other uh, neighboring cities were destroyed with fire and brimstone. Abraham made holy intercession trying to get God to refrain from it by going back and forth and reasoning with God. And only Lot and his daughters were able to come out safely. And the rest of the people, including Lot's wife, was destroyed because of the sins that they were committed. Before God allowed that to happen, the word of God said that he sent angels to communicate to Lot and to tell Lot what was going on. And they also said something that was interest that, that was quite interesting to me. It said that they said um, that they will go and see if what is recorded, I guess, in heaven, forgot the exact word but verbiage. I would have to go back into Genesis. But the angels were on a mission to go and see if the Sodom, if the people of Sodom Gomorrah and Gomorrah and Zeboim and the other people, if they were actually guilty enough for the judgment of the Lord. And so as God is communicating to Abraham what's going on, and as the angels are visiting Lot and preparing Lot to vacate, they actually find, because of the, the scenarios with Lot, that yes, these people are worthy of the judgment of God. They investigated, they, they saw the sins of the people and that it was worthy of damnation. And you can read throughout the Bible how God is holy in his judgments, how God is, his desires that not anyone perish, but they would come to the awareness of who he is. Many of us perish, not because, many of us perish because of the lack of knowledge, not because it's not available to us, especially in this day and age of technology. It's just, we don't care to know what God is doing. We don't want to know what God is doing. But there's this woman in um, the book of Luke, and we could read her in any other books, and she's believed in, in Luke's passage to be Mary, Lazarus, who died's sister. She was a woman known of great sin, and people around her knew that she was in great sin. And Jesus forgave her of her sins in such a way that when she heard that Jesus was in this house, she came to visit Jesus, and she had what was her most prized possession in her hand. The Bible says it's this alabaster box filled with this fragrant perfume that when she broke this alabaster box on Jesus as a sign of anointing him, it filled the whole room. And it describes in different passages how her gratitude for God and what Jesus had did for her and her newfound life and new direction in life that just came from the mercies of God through Jesus Christ. It said that her her gratitude, her heart was demonstrated in that she gave the most prized possession to Jesus and she humbled herself as a servant. She got one Bible said, one passage said that she just simply kneeled before Jesus and began to wash his feet with her very tears and wiped it with her, eye, her hair. Another passage describes that she wasn't even doing this in front of him. She was behind him doing all this great humility as she's doing this people are understanding what's going on people don't agree that this is even happening and then you got this Simon you got this Pharisee who was a, a leper Simon the leper and who also was Judas Iscariot the betrayer's dad if y'all didn't know that this is Bible study day I'm gonna give y'all some tokens as we go through this conversation he was who Jesus delivered from leprosy. He's also a Pharisee. You see that his response to his newfound life and direction is greatly different from this prostitute, so it seems. And this Pharisee who had leprosy and was cleansed begins to think in his mind, if this dude was really a prophet, as though he didn't receive healing from the hands of Jesus, then he would really know what manner of woman this is. Jesus stops for a second and addresses that thought in that heart. That's a heart. See, we don't have a lot of times the ability to look at people or circumstances of life and judge it like God would judge it. We know things a lot of times black and white. 
And it should be that way. We don't know how to be like God and send angels, although he already knows everything. He's the all in all. We don't know to go send angels to investigate of a condition before proceeding with the, the judgment that is just. We don't know how to um, hear of a rumor or allegations of a person or a people or a place and not assume evil against them or judge them unrighteously. That's why the word of God says that we shouldn't just judge. And if we're going to judge, let's do it righteously. A lot of us, that's the issue. We don't necessarily know how to righteously judge and discern from good and evil. We don't know how to do that. We're very sensual. We're very, very, very sensual that way. And we're very particular and partial in many regards. So when you have a woman who is so greatly impacted with what Jesus has done for her and she's responding that way and Jesus is receiving it, but other people can't seem to relate to why Jesus is okay with this. It tells us where we are as a people, what we, in, what we are in danger of doing to others because we can discourage the process of God. We can discourage someone's development, not realizing who the person is and how God sees them. And so Jesus addresses that. Jesus addresses the way that they're thinking about um, her and gives us a new way. And I'm going to read it to you. It's in Luke chapter 7 and I'm going to start at um, 43, although it's, it starts sooner than that because verse 37 talks about who she is in this whole alabaster box and she's standing behind him wiping her um, wiping his feet with her hair as she kisses his feet and anoints it. So it goes, Simon answered and said, um, hold on, where do I start, Lord? He said, all right. And Jesus answered him, answering, said to him, Simon, I have somewhat to say to you. And he said, master, say on, you know, and Jesus said, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors, one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave both of them. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, well, I suppose that he whom he forgave most. And Jesus said to him, you have rightly judged. And Jesus returned to the woman and said to Simon, you see this woman right here? I entered into your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs on her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, has not stopped kissing my feet. My head with oil you did not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And Jesus says to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And this is the latter part of it, and this is what I love the most. And it says, and they that sat at me with Jesus began to say within themselves, who is this that forgives sins also? And this is my part. And Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. There's a need for us to know who God is, first of all. Acknowledge that he loves you in such a way that he doesn't want you to perish. But he is righteous in, in that he requires us to all live righteous lives. He will forgive you if you come to me and not acknowledge how wretched and undone you really are. And he will accept you as a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have been made new. He gives you power to remain in that condition of holiness as you endure with him. He gives you power to say no to temptations that you didn't have power to say no to. He gives you power to love people that you didn't once find the grace to suffer. Jesus gives you all of the stuff that presently, if you are outside of him, you feel like it's impossible. I just cannot do it. I remember not yet being filled with the power of God, wondering how do you even stay saved because of the many attempts that I've seen other people make and the attempts that I've made. I've tried and failed. And then you learn God empowers you to love. God empowers you to forgive Power, God empowers you to endure by the spirit of the living God. He enables you to know truth and, to, and he guides you in all truth. 
And the Spirit of God brings what you need to your remembrance to help guide your footsteps. So when we are in a position where God could have judged us, could have destroyed us, but yet he saw something different. And he was able to inquire and see in you that there was still something small that remained in you. And said, you're worth investing in. You're worth cleansing. You're worth taking and adopting and renaming. You're worth equipping and educating and sending out. You can't help. You can't help. But cry out to God in a place of humility and say, Lord, who am I that you are so mindful of me? Because he has gotten so far. Even if you are in the beginning stages in your walk with God, the things that he already has done for you are things that were just impossible in your own strength. That is a lot, That was a great work that God has performed in you. And if you have been someone who's been in the faith for many years, you have seen the wondrous, miraculous work of God working on your behalf. And you have seen a continual transformation process taking place within you that makes you more like him, that draws you closer to him. You know, if you aren't giving yourself more to God, then you are being separate from God. The danger in being separate from God is that you are open or vulnerable to the enemy and his devices. I can't chance that. So I humble myself. I humble myself because God will remove people. God will destroy cities. God will curse nations. And he can totally just cause you to, to cease to exist. He can take your very breath away. You can lay your head down for a quick nap because you think that's all it's going to be. And he takes the breath of life away from you. We have no control. I have no power over my voice. I have no power over my stature. I have no power over who I am in the natural. That was all God's decision. God decided who my natural mother and father was going to be. God decided where I was going to be in the world. God decided when I was going to come to him and under what conditions. God determines who I am in his kingdom and what he's anointed me to do. God is in control of all of it and as we surrender to the power of God and the, 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 the will of God the more peace we have to walk by faith then we can hear those awesome words your faith has saved you go in peace I have to have a faith to believe that God is good I have to have a faith to believe that I, 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 I should not be afraid I have to have faith to know that God is with me because his word says he'll never leave or forsake me I got to know that when I fall, that in order to remain righteous in God's eyes is I have to get up and keep going again because he's with us and he will forever be with us. So today I want you to remember above all things that it is God who cleanses you and makes you whole. It is God who has redeemed you and has given your life meaning. It is God that has allowed you to be accepted um, in his kingdom and is giving you favor with with man and the host of heaven God is who allows for you to live and move and have your being and you have to live in a way that says God I'm grateful I'm grateful for all that you do I'm not just grateful because you give me the desires of my heart I'm grateful because I was a sinner that was on the way to hell and you gave me hope and you saved me and you've reconciled me with the Father. And you've given me a heart for Him. So now everything that I do is with the purposes of, of God in mind. I love God and you have to love Him. And you always have to do what He tells you to do. you got to be willing to surrender. Even if people don't understand that, man, I know what God has done for me. And I know who I was, but I also know where God is leading me. And, and be confident that God is like God is liking you and loving you and is keeping you and is with you. So that's really all I have to say today. I'm grateful. I'm grateful because God has taken me a very, very long way. I like to share intimate details about my life with you guys because I think it helps your walk with God seem real. But it also lets you know that you're not alone on the, on the, in, on the straight and narrow path. You're not alone. Many people can relate to you. The word of God says that Jesus is well acquainted with our grief. We, we, he understands 
many of the times I can relate. And I'm saying God has taken me a very, very, very long way. He has done a good work in me. And he's done a good work in many people that I know. And when you step back and evaluate, you know, man, that was just God. That was God that did that. So if God did that then, he will do that now. And he will do that later. And we got to love him enough to give him more and more and more. And every time he presents an opportunity for you to draw closer to him, you got to want to know that that is a blessing. That is an honor bestowed upon man. The opportunity to sit with the king of kings. The opportunity to sit and dine with him, to hear him, to, to understand him. To know things that can preserve your life. To, to tell you things that can cause you to escape destruction like Lot. That's, that's, the, that's what the benefits of being near to God does. Lot was near enough to a source that he escaped what most people did not escape. Having the right motive and heart, like the people in the book of Joshua, it isn't just to offer sacrifices. It's for a witness in the earth and for many generations in our children to come to know that we love God and he's good. He's good. We have to be a witness so we're not building altars these days. But my heart is extended and my life will show that I'm a witness of the true and living God. In Jesus' name.